Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Miyako Yerick, and I'm the club administrator for the Columbia DC Alumni Club. Tonight, we are very excited to have Professor Glenn Denning and Jeffrey Freilich to talk with us for Universal Food Security, How to End Hunger While Protecting the Planet. Professor Denning joined SEPA in 2009 as founding director of the Master of Public Administration and Development Practice at a joint undertaking with SEPA and Columbia University's Earth Institute. He teaches core courses on global food systems and sustainable development practice and policy. He continues to serve on the Earth Institute faculty as chair. And prior to joining SEPA, he helped establish the MDG Center of East and South, South Southern Africa in Kenya, serving as its founding director from 2004 to 2009. And we do have more detailed bios on our website if you would like to see more. Jeffrey is a climate risk analyst at the Environmental Defense Fund. Prior to joining EDF, he worked as an environmental scientist for the Department of Homeland Security. He currently lives in Washington, DC, and is the lead for the Columbia Alumni Global Sustainability Network, an international multidisciplinary community interested in creating a shared sustainable future. And you do have a link to CAGSN, uh, which is on our website, as well as in the email reminder, which you received. Jeff is planning to gather like-minded people to join the global movement. So if you're interested in joining that, please do uh, check out that information. I also just want to note that our partners tonight are the Harvard Club of Washington, D.C., the University of Queensland in America, and the Global Alumni, the Columbia Alumni Global Sustainability Network. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And with that, I will stop my screen share and hand it over to Professor Denning to kick us off. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with, with all of you this evening. Um, so uh, what I would like to do, uh, we'll begin with a, a short presentation um, on the topic of uh, universal food security. And I will uh, begin by uh, sharing slides. We'll see how this works. Um, right. Uh, I think I think we're good. So um, the first thing I want you all to do is 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 take a moment and and just imagine imagine a food secure world, a genuinely food secure world, a world where we have no hunger, no malnutrition, no overweight and obesity. Then take another step and imagine that all of the food that we eat is produced, managed, distributed in ways that don't harm the environment and even start to repair some of the damage that we've been doing to the environment in our desperate efforts to feed humanity. So that's basically what I described as universal food security, a world where every person enjoys a healthy diet derived from sustainable food systems. That's the focus of the book that I've written, and that's the focus of our discussion this evening. So let me start um, in one slide. I want to give you what I think of as a, a brief history of the global food system. And it begins in the top left where you see hunters and gatherers uh, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, uh, population perhaps 10 million as best we know, at the beginning of the stage of what we call uh, the Neolithic revolution, the shift towards agriculture. And we move forward through subsistence agriculture, which we still see in many parts of the world today where people are basically producing for their own consumption, right through to highly sophisticated mechanized food systems like the one you see on the screen here, uh, uh, harvesting soybeans in, in Brazil, through to vertical farming systems, again, highly sophisticated, even without soil, 
um, producing food in, in urban settings. This has led to food systems of the type and distribution and, and, and marketing systems as the type you can see here. The example uh, on, the, on the bottom left is from uh, a, 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 like a, a, a Trader Joe or a, a, a Whole Foods or one of these supermarkets you might see in, in New York City with an enormous array of uh, fresh processed packaged foods. But at the same time, if you then move to the right, you'll see uh, another uh, aspect of our global food system. And that is the fact that around one in five children under the age of five um, suffers from uh, chronic malnutrition or stunting, which, which greatly reduces their educational possibilities, uh, their, their future um, livelihoods and, 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 and longevity. So the, the challenge of the global food system has, has, has prompted many to um, uh, refer back to Thomas Malthus. In, in 1798, Malthus wrote on the principle of population where he described the, uh, what he described as the natural inequality of population growth vis-a-vis -vis production of food. And, and basically, uh, population grows exponentially or geometrically, whereas food expands essentially based on the availability of labor. And, and as we increase labor, we can increase the area of, of, of food production in a, in a linear way. And what that would lead to is what Malthus, of course, um, uh, he, he described it as a gigantic inevitable famine or uh, has subsequently been described as the Malthusian catastrophe. Now, the fascinating part is that Malthus wrote this um, at a time when the world's population was 1 billion. Today, uh, earlier this year, we passed 8 billion. We're on our way to perhaps near 10 billion by 2050 and perhaps leveling off at around 11 billion uh, by the end of the century. Now, in the 1960s, in fact, in 1968, William and Paul Paddock uh, wrote a book called Famine 1975, where there was really uh, a resurgence of, of, of the Malthusian hypothesis. Um, this was at a time when the world population had increased to uh, a little over 3 billion. And th the solution there was basically um, a triage system. And, and, and the reason for that was that the United States was the only country that was generating surpluses, significant surpluses of food. And the Paddock brothers back in 68, basically determined whether countries could be saved or not. And uh, ironically, India, they described could not be saved. Egypt could not be saved. Haiti could not be saved. This was very typical, um, uh, rhetoric and, and, and one might call analysis uh, uh, at a time when uh, there were widespread hunger, malnutrition and, and, and famines, particularly across the South Asian continent, subcontinent, I should say. So in ab around that same time, um, Norman Borlaug, uh, who was a, a scientist who had uh, from the United States um, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, started working in Mexico in the 1940s and into the 1950s. He developed high yielding wheat varieties in response to the need to increase food production in Mexico. Um, Borlaug became what, who was known as the, the father of the, of the Green Revolution. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 um, for, for that effort. And uh, in the 60s, 66, 67, those wheat varieties were uh, introduced into South Asia, India and Pakistan in particular, and that triggered this, this uh, what was known as the, as the Green Revolution. Now, uh, around the same time, very much uh, encouraged by the work of Borlaug, 
the International Rice Research Institute was established in the Philippines in 1960 by the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations. I worked at this institute between 1980 and 1998, almost 20 years. Um, what was really the second phase of the Green Revolution. What it was best known for was the development of high yielding, uh, uh, short statured, early maturing rice varieties. Uh, and this had an enormous effect uh, on, on food security, particularly uh, across, across Asia. Some of the impacts of that Green Revolution are outlined in, uh, outlined in this slide. Um, between 1970 and uh, 1995, cereal production doubled uh, across Asia. So that's wheat and rice, the two principal cereals. Population increased by 60%. So already you see that, that production was able to keep ahead of, uh, of, of, of population. Now the cultivated area, the area planted to crops only increased by 4%. In fact, something like it was estimated that 18 to 27 million hectares of, of, of forest land was saved as a result of this uh, crop intensification process. Food prices were lower, hunger and poverty were reduced across Asia. And this became what became known as uh, the engine of structural transformation, the process through which improvements in agricultural productivity actually laid the foundation for uh, increases in manufacturing and service uh, uh, sectors. So um, this was Asia's uh, green revolution. Now, Borlaug, when he won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in, in 1970, he pointed out that the green revolution would only be a temporary success. Um, he argued that this would provide breathing space, uh, but that, that that breathing space might only last for three decades. He was very, very much concerned about what he called the population monster. And you can see by this um, graph on, on, on the right of this slide that in fact, he was, he was right. Um, aside from a food crisis in 72, 75, there was um, general stability in terms of food prices all the way up until the early 2000s. And then around 2007, we had our first major food crisis um, uh, since the 1970s. And then COVID came along 2020 to 2022. And now we've got the um, Ukraine crisis. And all of these have essentially resulted in food prices increasing almost to a level of double what they were um, back in the, in the, in the 1980s and, and, and 1990s. So this gives you a sense of the fragility of the global food system. Now, the, um, the World Food Program, uh, which is really the, the, the UN's uh, food uh, humanitarian um, agency dealing with food security, um, it basically issued a, a, a red alert, which, um, which they described as a, uh, a global food crisis like no other. So a red alert based on um, the state of, of, of hunger and food deprivation uh, in the world. Now, let me um, sort of detail this uh, quantitatively and start by describing uh, what I call um, the healthy diet scorecard. So number one, um, 800 million people in the world right now, one in 10 are hungry. And that is a, a, the definition of hungry in this sense, it's used by the Food and Agriculture Organization, is that um, these are, this is energy deprivation. So this is purely based on the availability of calories. More than 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, iron, vitamin A, folate, uh, iodine, and the like. As I mentioned earlier, 150 million children are stunted. Children under the age of five, that means they're short for their age. So that's one in five children under the age of five. 50 million children are wasted, which means they're underweight um, um, for their height. And, and, and this is a, a major, this is called acute malnutrition and it puts these children at great risk. 
More than 2.5 billion people are overweight and one third of them are obese. If we put all these numbers together uh, and uh, recognizing there's a certain amount of overlap among the different categories, we come to the conclusion that about 4 billion people, half of the world's population, are consuming a less than healthy diet. Now let's look at the other side of universal food security, the planetary health, right? The food that is being produced is leading to deforestation and forest degradation. It's leading to land degradation, which can be the result of soil erosion or just nutrient depletion. Um, it, in many parts of the world, it's leading to unsustainable water extraction. Uh, out of all the fresh water that's extracted by us for various means, 70% of that goes to agriculture worldwide. Um, we're facing biodiversity loss, both on land and on water. And importantly, um, the food system contributes one third of the anthropogenic, uh, the net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, one third coming from the food system, one part of which is agriculture, but other parts include deforestation and various pre and post harvest um, activities. So the conclusion we're going to draw from all of this is that we are far from a world where every person enjoys a healthy diet derived from sustainable food systems. So that's what prompted me to work on this book uh, and to look at a strategy drawing on the evidence, uh, the literature, uh, practice, and 40 years of experience as a field practitioner. And I came to the conclusion that there are five major areas where we could focus on in context and invest in, in order to achieve this transformed food system that would be productive, profitable, inclusive, healthy, sustainable, resilient, and ethical. And I'm gonna go through these five areas now, um, very briefly, sustainable intensification, market infrastructure, post-harvest stewardship, healthy diets and social protection. And there are a number of other cross-cutting issues which I won't go into uh, perhaps uh, uh, later in the, in the, in the Q&A. So first of all, sustainable intensification. What is that? Many people think of that as an oxymoron. How can you intensify and still be sustainable? So the, the general idea here is that um, intensification means using existing land. It means not extending but intensifying, producing more from existing land, but without the level of uh, environmental footprint that previously existed. So more food, less environmental impact, negative environmental uh, impact. Why do we need more food? That's a longer story, but the reality is population marches on. I said, we're gonna move from 8 billion to 10 billion. People's diets are changing. Um, uh, incomes are increasing. Urbanization is taking place. And, and the alternative to intensification is extensification, which means removing forest, planting more of that forest to agriculture. That's going on in the world. But the argument is that it is possible to intensify. And I'll take a few minutes to talk about that later. Now, why is it intensification important? Well, it, this, this uh, image here, this map of the world shows that in 1961, we had half a hectare uh, of cropland per person. 2021, it's basically half of that, 0.24. And it's projected that by 2050, we'll be down to about 0.2 of a hectare. So if we've got less land per person, the, there's really only one alternative. We intensify on that existing land or we open up new land. That's the choice. The second area of investment is market infrastructure. Simply put, what we're trying to do here is do a much better job of connecting production to consumption. And that involves transport systems, electrification, communication, information communication technologies. 
working out ways so we can more efficiently um, move food from where it's produced to where it's consumed. The third area of investment is post-harvest stewardship. And this re recognizes this stark reality, the fact that one third of all the food that is produced is lost or wasted. Okay, so post-harvest, um, the amount of food around 14% is lost, which means up to the retail stage, um, on-farm losses, transport losses and the like. And then another 17% is lost in retail uh, services and household waste. In fact, household waste is the largest. That's around 11% out of that 17%. Uh, so altogether, one third uh, is, is, is lost. And there are various ways, technological, behavioral and others, available to be able to address and reduce um, those losses. The fourth area is healthy diets. And really there's two sides to that. What, what we want is a convergence around a healthy diet. And that means for those who are undernourished, we have to fill the nutrient gaps. We have to fill the gaps in nutrition so that no one is undernourished. On the other side of the ledger, as I mentioned, 2.5 billion overweight, a third of them obese. We have to curb nutrient intake of excessive uh, uh, nutrient intake, which is creating all manner of, of challenges because of those unhealthy diets. And the fifth area, and this is for people basically, when you, you can get your food from production or you can get it from buying with your income, the third way is 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 somebody gives you that food right so that's what social protection 1.5 billion people uh, in the world today get some form of social protection which contributes to their food security um, well known of course is the the outstanding work of the world food program and other humanitarian organizations but at the same time here in the united states um, we were very well aware of the importance of social protection systems during COVID when large numbers of people were going hungry and were desperate for um, additional food to be able to sort of meet their daily needs. So social protection is one of those five areas. So um, I, I think of that as the big five. Uh, you know, people will have different arguments over, the, over what else could be put into that and, and what might not be included. Water and sanitation, clean water and sanitation, of course, and other things as well. I put them under cross-cutting. However you want to chop it up, I really do think that based on the experience and what, what I've read of the situation, um, these five areas are a very good place to start. So let's go from strategy to implementation. It's all very good to have this strategy. It's already very good to, to know what to do, but, but how do we do it? What do, how do we actually make this happen? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And um, I'll, I'll sort of share a few key points here. The first is it, it takes really a, a, a whole of society approach. It requires the involvement of the public sector, the private sector, the third sector, what we think of as the third sector is the um, the non-for-profit, non not-for-profit organizations, the philanthropic organizations. It requires the involvement of universities building, who are able to build capacity um, of actors who can work in all manner of organizations, public, private, third sector. And it requires individuals because ultimately um, acting alone or acting in institutions, behavioral change and, and leadership is going to be key. Um, the second is that it, we have to work at multiple levels, from the highest level, international, national, right down to local levels. It requires top-down approach and bottom-up approach. Um, I have come to the conclusion, and I, I get to it in sort of chapter 16 of, of the book, that the, the real thing we need is a new generation, a new cadre of practitioner leaders people who are interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral and practice oriented, folks who have the know-how and the do-how. It requires both. It requires leadership and um, leadership is necessary to bring together all these components that are necessary for implementation, finance, good governance, 
policies, innovation, communication, negotiation, and capacity. I've identified 12 attributes, which I think um, are, are relevant um, for, the, in terms of the, 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 the competen competencies that are needed for a truly transformational leader in food systems. I'll just share a few of those with you now. Um, number two, connecting the dots, the complexity of food systems and, and, and being able to solve problems within food systems requires that we understand complexity, understand trade-offs, understand synergies. Um, secondly, uh, the, the transformational leader needs to show courage and diplomacy. Both are important. Courage without diplomacy um, can, can lead, have, lead to very bad outcomes. Um, strategies and plans have to be crafted, but we need to revise them often. Um, we need to stress test and pilot test promising ideas, but don't wait for perfection. Coalitions of diverse partners are important because in this business, nobody is in charge. Collective action is needed. So, so the ability to build, nurture and deploy those coalitions is important. And finally, it's essential if that is going to work to share credit and be prepared to sacrifice credit for success. Finally, I just wanted to mention what I think of as really the the, the seven grand challenges and opportunities for achieving universal food security. First, as I mentioned before, stunting, reducing stunting to near zero is, 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 is a great challenge, an important challenge um, when you think of the consequences and the irreversibility of stunting, chronic undernutrition. Reversing overweight and obesity, no country on earth has been able to do that yet. A huge challenge. We have a lot of information on what seems to have positive effects, but as I said, at the national level, at, a, at, a, at scale, we haven't been able to reverse the continuous growth in overweight and obesity and consequent um, diseases associated with that. Applying genetic engineering, whether it be for crops or animals, in ways that lead to equitable and sustainable outcomes. Genetic engineering is widely used in the industrial world, in, 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 in large-scale industrial agriculture. It's not widely used yet uh, in, in other settings, but the potential is there. That potential is yet to be realized. Smallholder farmers are going to be key, but the key challenges are finance and insurance because smallholder farmers operate in very risky environments. So how to do that in a way that sort of sustains improvements that, that we're looking for in agriculture. How to integrate emergency assistance and development. That's a, that's a big puzzle. These tend to be in, in very different silos. Uh, those responsible for emergency assistance and those responsible for development, different institutions. It's very rare to bring them together, but we really need to bring them together to reduce ultimately dependency on both. So, and the final or well, the second final one is operationalizing uh, carbon capture in agriculture. This is another huge challenge that I think um, has, has enormous potential. I mentioned the food system generates a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon capture through various production systems has the potential to absorb some of that, uh, some of those greenhouse gas emissions. But we've, we've known about that for decades, but we haven't been able to operationalize that at scale. And finally, um, artificial intelligence for food systems transformation, looking at ways in which we can tap this new knowledge, this new ability of digital technologies to um, enable transformation. So, <coughs> excuse me, with that, I shall um, close and uh, pass it back uh, uh, to you, uh, Jeff. Thanks so much, India. I'll let you take some water. Um, 
thank you for that overview presentation. Very helpful. Um, so I want to take a little bit of time before handing it off to the audience for Q&A to kind of dig into some of the sections of your book specifically. And I was glad to see that you kind of opened with Malthus in a discussion of sort of his thoughts on population growth. I know he kind of introduced carrying capacity, which I think emerges kind of throughout a lot of the discussion on population growth. And I know in the chapter you discussed um, Paul Ehrlich's work on the population bomb. So I'm curious, kind of digging into population here, that obviously a bigger, you know, global population means more mouths to feed, but it also comes with all these other kind of competing land, you know, conflicts of in terms of where do all these people live, you know, what kind of infrastructure do we have to build out to sort of accommodate additional bodies kind of on the planet. Um, so I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on sort of how can we balance the sort of competing land use um, for land, specifically with rising populations when, you know, one plot of land maybe could be used for development to sort of house a lot of, you know, maybe low income communities, for example, or, you know, how do you kind of weigh, you know, choosing which one is kind of ideal, um, whether or not you should be doing, you know, X or whether or not it should be kind of focused on, you know, growing crop production there, for example. No. Well, I mean, that's oh, clearly that's a very, uh, one would have a very context specific answer to that. I don't think there's a, there's a general, um, a general solution there. The, the, the broader point is, is, is really the one I made when I uh, included sustainable intensification as, as one of the key uh, investment areas. That actually recognizes the fact that um, our land resources are, you know, are, are limited, are absolutely limited. Um, and if we are to conserve biodiversity, um, we really need to um, essentially stop where we are now in terms of deforestation. So that leaves us with land that we are currently cultivating and land that uh, in many cases has been degraded and even abandoned. And uh, I argue that that there is, you know, you've got to think of sustainable intensification as a process in uh, aggregate. And some parts of the world are, uh, and, and a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there's tremendous potential for further intensification um, without significant uh, you know, in, in environmental negatives associated with that. Um, there are large areas of degraded land that can be brought back into agricultural production, but some should not be brought back into production at all. Some should be probably um, uh, put into grazing lands or, or forestry or other, other, other land use. Uh, I, I would argue that we need to be very careful going forward in terms of expansion of, of our urban footprint. The reason being, um, you know, the reason cities are where they are more often than not is that they're near quite fertile uh, lands. Um, this, this is where populations uh, actually came together. Um, so I think it, it requires both, um, you know, very careful urban planning and, 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 and policies to limit, uh, you know, really limit the use of or the expansion of urban land onto productive agricultural land. Um, but I think you, you, you're going to need a, a sort of a combination of, of, of these different policies, intensification, de-intensification in some cases. Um, we know that there are you know, various parts of the world, um, Europe, parts of the United States, parts of China and elsewhere, where uh, input levels uh, are creating environmental damage to, you know, to, to land, to water and to the broader ecosystems, and we need to de-intensify in those areas. But overall, we do need more food. I've never seen, I mean, what the actual amount is, um, different experts will, it ranges from 25% to 100% more food, but I've never seen any sensible estimate that says we don't need any additional food. So um, I think we've got, I mean, that's, that's the whole idea behind sustainable intensification. And I think you've made a good point in, um, in bringing up the urban, the urban footprint side of it as well. 
And I, I was I enjoyed seeing your discussion about um, carbon capture on farms specifically because I know there's a lot of discussion right now in terms of the carbon dioxide removal kind of sphere of things that there are um, you know kind of two options that require land, but they they are using land to grow you know, biomass feedstock that is not directly kind of consumed. It is used for either biochar produ production or bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. So it's like diverting land to grow this kind of feedstock, but it is not kind of going towards, you know, con contributing to sort of yeah. production. Yeah. Do, do you see that as a sort of a conflicting um, sort of, do you see that as a conflict to achieving, you know, universal foods that should we kind of take that off the table and maybe focus on other carbon dioxide removal methods or sort of what are you, what are your thoughts on, you know, how can we integrate carbon capture directly into the food system directly? Is it agroforestry? I know there's afforestation efforts, yeah. uh, but um, obviously trees take time to remove CO2. So um, how would you kind of weigh the, the land use for some of this carbon dioxide removal methodology versus land that we could be growing food on, but instead it's used for energy production or, you know, removing carbon dioxide. Well, I think, I think it's, it's, a it's, a we essentially need a science-based uh, land use planning uh, approach. I think, I think the areas that are best suited for food production, we need to be, um, we need to be growing food and growing it very well, growing it efficiently. And, and frankly, uh, in those areas, you know, clearly minimizing the as much as we can with science and technology and good practice, minimizing greenhouse gas emissions from those areas. But one won't be necessarily reducing them to zero. Right. There, there will still be emissions coming from those areas. You know, I, I think the great um, opportunity is uh, I, I don't see it as so much of a conflict, but I think there are there are vast areas of land which can be brought into some form of production, whether it's forestry or agroforestry um, that that can in fact capture capture carbon in, in the long term, land for which we should not be annual cropping in any case. Uh, we could include, you know, within that we could be thinking about, um, you know, a, a horticultural, um, you know, um, orchards and the like, you know, fruit trees and 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 uh, other other you know higher value products that can be used. But um, you know, I, I my, my sense is there's there's more than enough land there without taking good food producing agricultural land out of production in order to capture carbon. So I think we work we work on both one improving efficiency, reducing you know, uh, losses, whether it you know be carbon dioxide, methane or nitrous oxide. And elsewhere, we, we, we do our best to suck that carbon dioxide out, out of the environment, but, but also use it for, I mean, if we can, if we can use it for um, uh, commercial means, you know, whether it be timber or, 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 or our products. Thank you, thank you. All right, so I want to jump to chapter three, where you discuss soil and land. Um, so kind of continuing on this land conversation. But um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the primary differences between organic and non-organic crops and sort of which method of farming is more uh, detrimental to the planet. Because I think in the United States specifically, consumers have a ton of choice between Inorg or, yeah, organic or inorganic. There's also, and I will get to this GMO question eventually, but yeah. there's a lot of kind of, a lot of consumer driven, you know, choices out there. Um, so in terms of, you know, planetary impact, organic and non-organic, which one is, you know, more harmful in, in which mm. way? Uh, let me see. They can Either one could be very harmful. I'm not going to say which is more harmful than the other, um, but at the same time, neither of them uh, is 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 on its own a panacea. Um, so I th I think the the problem that what I've tried to address in the book is this um, really what often ends up to be a, a kind of a false dichotomy. That, that you've either, that, that, and I think you did it as devil's advocate perhaps, but you know, like which one is okay, organic or inorganic? Well, they're both, 
Um, they both have a place. Uh, I mean, all agriculture is organic, to be honest, uh, but I know what you're saying. So systems that involve fertilizers that possibly involve pesticides of some kinds or herbicides and the like clearly is viewed as not organic, right? Um, and, and the thing is, you know, most of the food, about half of the food produced in the world is produced because of inorganic fertilizer. I mean, that's a fact, right? So if, if we were to suddenly say inorganic is bad, we stop tomorrow, um, I mean, it would never happen because of the catastrophe that would be caused. And if you want a good example, take a look at what happened to Sri Lanka when the government uh, introduced organic agriculture as the, the policy. Um, they ended up, you know, I mean, the amount of food they needed to import was much more than they, uh, they, they were using to, to, to purchase fertilizer. Um, it, it was a complete and utter disaster. Now that is not an argument uh, to go, you know, all forward, uh, more fertilizer, the better kind of thing. Um, in organic fertilizer. You know, the best systems out there are typically integrated systems, systems that uh, involve the use of both inorganic and organic sources, uh, in, you know, crop rotations, uh, crop livestock systems, uh, intercropping and, and, and the like. There are many systems out there that really incorporate what uh, some people refer it to as integrated soil fertility management. And, and this is really looking at available resources. Um, so I think we need to be looking at blended approaches um, in order to get the best possible outcome. Um, organic is fine um, in, in, in many settings. Um, organic is, is a, you know, organic is a business, right? You, you can have industrial organic farming because, because it's, it's, it's big business now. Uh, there's a market for it. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, half of the farmers in Africa arguably are organic farmers because they cannot access fertilizer. Uh, uh, soils are being degraded, eroded, nutrient depleted. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no joy in being an organic farmer in that sort of setting. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's again, you know, my, my encouragement to everybody is to think in terms of these uh, blended approaches to try to separate oneself from the, 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 the rhetoric and, and the sort, you know, as I call it, the sort of false dichotomies uh, that, it, that, that exist out there and rather think about the outcome. And I think we all want the same outcome. We want food security and we want healthy soils uh, and, and we want uh, clean water and we want to preserve biodiversity. And uh, we just need to work out systems that will enable us to get there. For sure. And a big theme in this chapter, too, is you discuss kind of the key differences between industrial and conservation agriculture. Can you just speak a little bit about those kind of key differences and, you know, maybe some pros and cons of each method of agriculture? Well, um, OK, so the, the conservation agriculture is, is a sort of a different is something a little bit different and that that has to do with a um it's it's mainly to do with a a system of farming that reduces tillage that reduces the plowing um and and that in fact is uh you know quite widely used uh in in the united states uh and uh, in other industrial agricultural sort of settings in, in, in Latin America, in Australia and so on, um, to a lesser extent in the developing world. One of the reasons is that once, well, first of all, the reason one is doing it, there are, there are different reasons. One is for soil conservation. The more you disturb, disturb the soil, the more erosion you're going to get. Um, but another advantage is that, you know, reduced tillage means reduced energy costs. So that is another that is that's another one of the advantages. There is some evidence that uh, uh, carbon can be captured in in that way. It's it's somewhat controversial. It's not it's not as as clear cut as it sometimes sounds. Um, so yeah, conservation agriculture is a is 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 another system that works in 
in context. Um, the fact that not everybody has adopted it uh, would suggest that there are circumstances under which it's not applicable, um, that, that the constraints um, outweigh the advantages. Um, and again, so I think it's, it's again, some, one of these things that I would not say we should all be shifting to conservation agriculture, but we should all be conscious of the need to reduce erosion. Um, you know, soil is, a, is, is in practice a finite resource and we've lost a lot of soil uh, in the United States and, and pretty much across the world. Uh, and we really can't afford to lose any more for the, for the reasons we just described that we, we, we need all the food we can get. And, um, and, you know, we, at some point we need to reduce our dependency on uh, inorganic fertilizers simply because some of them um, are a, a, a diminishing resource. Um, and, and, you know, they're certainly going to get costlier uh, over time. So, um, you know, really caring for the soil uh, is, 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 is critically important. And that's why my soils chapter became my longest chapter, because it was, it, it, I, as I got deeper into it, I realized that, um, you know, literally it's the foundation of our food system. And if we don't get that right, um, there's no hope uh, for, you know, sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of soil questions, but just for the sake of time, um, I will move to chapter five, which is titled Seeds of Life. Um, mm -hmm. And so this section, you describe an experience when you were in Malawi, you had to explain the difference between hybrid crops and GMO crops. Would you mind kind of offering an explanation to the audience about the key differences between hybrids and GMOs? <laughs> okay, well, I could refer them to the book, of course. But um, yes, that was, that was a, a funny uh, experience I had when, um, the person came up to me and said, I didn't know you were promoting uh, GMOs in Malawi. My immediate thought was to say, well, why would it matter if I was? But I, I was a bit more diplomatic and polite. And I said, well, um, well actually we're not. It's, it's, it's hybrid corn, um, hybrid maize, uh, maize in Africa, corn in the United States. And that hybrids have been around since, you know, commercially around since the 1920s and 30s in the United States. But, you know, by, by sort of 1940, 1950, you know, most American corn farmers were using hybrids. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a sort of a much simpler uh, crossbreeding system. Um, simple in one sense, but, but, but also requiring a level of sophistication that is, is handled through, um, through companies, through businesses. Um, farmers don't make their own hybrid seed. Um, they rely on, on, on businesses, seed companies, to provide them with hybrids that they would like to grow. Now, GMOs, genet what, what we refer to now as, as, as genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered crops, um, they're, 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 they're different, um, you know, new sort of molecular level methods are used to change the DNA um, so that new crops can demonstrate different characteristics, um, it, you know, but it's possible to have both, like most hybrid corn in the United States is now GM corn as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's possible to, you know, to, to basically have both. But, you know, they're, they're all part of a sequence, I would say, of, of genetic improvement that's been going on for 10,000 years. I mean, since the very um, first domestication uh, and, and generations of farmers doing their own selection based on random crosses that occurred in, 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 in their own fields. And uh, eventually, you know, through through Gregor Mendel and 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 the geneticists, basically, the idea was that you can actually start to manipulate those genes. So breeding came along, and now we're at a level where we can be much, much, much more precise uh, through you know genome editing and uh, you know taking advantage of in, in extraordinary tools that that currently exist to enable us to piece together the attributes that we want, um, whether it's for nutrition or whether it's for adaptation to climate change. Um, and, and, and this, you know, is, 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 is obviously part of our armory. And I, um, my main, uh, 
you know, chapter five, the, the main message I have there is um, in, in this world where half the population has an unhealthy diet, uh, in a world uh, where we're really struggling in the face of climate change and it's going to get a lot worse, why would we, t <clears throat> why would we take that off the table? <clears throat> I'd also argue from an equity side um, that most of the beneficiaries of genetic engineering up until now have been relatively large scale farmers in industrialized countries. Um, isn't it time we should be looking to pro poor uh, genetic engineering that could bring those benefits to low income farmers and low income consumers uh, around the world? So I think there's, there's a, a number of arguments that would suggest that um, it would be um, rather foolhardy to take a blanket opposition to something, um, you know, uh, largely on ideological rather than scientific grounds. Gotcha. Yeah, I know in this chapter two, you discuss a handful of, you know, kind of GMO success stories. I, th I think of the golden rice that you talk about in the chapter, which was able to sort of tackle a vitamin A deficiency. Um, and I too, so during my undergrad, I was able to travel to the Mekong Delta and to sort of see several of the rice institutes down there. And I know that they are currently kind of working on different rice varietals that are, you know, more resilient to saltwater intrusion into the patties. And there's a lot of really good things coming out of, you know, GMO kind of crops. But then also I know like in the United States, there's a lot of kind of controversy around them. I think kind of immediately about Monsanto and the Roundup Ready crop kind of <coughs> lawsuits that have kind of come out from around there. But so do you, to what extent, and it, it sounds like you think um, that GMOs are basically almost like a, I'd say, instrumental part of kind of tackling the food security you know, or tackling food insecurity that you, we should not take them off the table and that largely kind of they are a, a force of good, would you say? Well, I, yes, I would say we shouldn't take them off the table. Um, I, I would also say that it's not, uh, you know, we we don't necessarily, there's a lot we can do even without uh, genetically engineered uh, crops. Um, and I'm not saying even we use them as a last resort, only if we can't do something else. I'm saying that, uh, look, we have, let's look at the world today and look at the challenges we have. We need, you know, we need information technology. We need genetic engineering technology. We need, we need, um, a, 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 we need, all of our tools in order to ad ad address those problems. Like every new technology, we have to look at the, um, the risks um, and we have to look at the, um, at the benefits. Um, and one of the risks is the risks of inaction. And um, you know, my, my concern, as I, as, I, as I just mentioned, is that um, the benefits of genetic engineering have not yet really reached small scale farmers in the developing world to a very limited extent with with GM cotton. But but other than that, it's it's hardly had any reach at all. And a lot of that has been, frankly, the the result of 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 scaremongering and 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 other um, opposition, uh, you know, to, to the use of it, which it was totally hypocritical because of the benefits that, you know, that, that the West have gotten from their own high tech systems, whether it's GM or otherwise. And to basically say, uh, you know, stick to your traditional crops and your traditional varieties um, and, you know, be, be happy with that. I, I just think it's, it's, it's scientifically faulty and, and, and morally corrupt. So um, I, I, I think we just, as I said, um, look at that as one of the various ways in which we can address food insecurity. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, in, the thing is, when it comes to climate change, be very clear about this, and I'm not sure if you're gonna ask me about climate change, I realize we're running a bit out of time, but um, if, we, if we, you know, agriculture today, was is the result the varieties that we have the you know the the traits that they have is the result of climates of the past and the present 
Um, but when that climate changes, our varieties are going to have to change very quickly in order to not um, sort of falter under those conditions of, of, of high temperatures of droughts and flood and increased salinity and the like. Um, so we need tools that will, will enable us to shift uh, our genetic resources and make use of the tremendous diversity of genetic resources that we actually have um, available as a result of you know, genetic conservation efforts over the decades. Uh, we need to put that to good use um, and, and it would be really foolhardy to, to basically say, uh, um, you know, let's, it, we don't know the consequences of, of that in the long term, therefore let's not go down that route. Yet we do know the consequences of inaction. You know, we, we, we can predict what's going to happen with high temperatures, floods, droughts, increased salinity, you know, increased, you know, disastrous events of various kinds. Um, let's get ready for it right now. Let's, let's, it's all hands on deck, really. Yeah. Alrighty. Yeah. As you mentioned, want to be conscious of time and there are 13 questions uh, queuing up in the Q&A. So Good. with that, um, as, as much as I would love to really get into the weeds on climate with you, um, let me pull up the Q&A. Um, let's see. Alrighty. Uh, one of the first questions we have from Jesper is that, will crop intensification make food production more vulnerable to climate change, increasingly common extreme weather events? Not sure if crop intensification per se makes it more vulnerable. Um, it, it depends what you're intensifying. If you're intensifying production of a vulnerable crop, then that's probably true. But if we combine it with the ideas that, that we've just been talking about in actually having um, crops that are better adapted to uh, emerging conditions, that are better adapted to drought, to flood, to um, higher temperatures, to extreme weather events. If, if we can intensify using, using um, that kind of, um, you know, th those genetic resources, I wouldn't say we're going to be um, more vulnerable. You know, I would say just broadly, we are going to be, you know, um, more vulnerable going forward. There's, there's no doubt about that. So we do have to come up with various kinds of strategies that enable us to better be able to, you know, manipulate our environment and, and manipulate our, you know, our, our agronomic systems to be able to, you know, manage, manage that risk. So I, I just don't think inherently um, intensification is going to, you know, it's going to do that. I think what intensification should be able to do is provide us with the, the buffer, the food buffers to be able to withstand um, crop failures uh, when, when they actually do occur. Because if we underinvest in order to reduce our risks, um, I, I, think, I think in the long term, um, we, we miss out. And I think it's there that some of these other uh, innovations, uh, you know, that I, I mentioned briefly in terms of, um, uh, you know, crop insurance based on, 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 you know, improved weather forecasting and, and, and these sort of new technologies uh, that enable us to better um, predict um, productivity under different uh, sort of climatic uh, uh, situations then, you know, I, I think uh, that is a better way of managing risk than, you know, whether we intensify or we don't intensify. Thank you. Okay, on to another question um, we have here. Please share with us your thoughts on financial resource mobilization required to achieve increased food production. In an increasingly polarized world, how can the international community ensure that resources are available for those who need it most? Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's a it's a good question, and um, it agriculture and food systems more broadly are, are, are most certainly under under resourced right now. Um, the, you know, there's probably 
it, it, it's a cyclical kind of thing. And, and generally, once there have been food crises, as there are now, you start to get a little bit more sort of coming back into uh, you know, more of the international community is in investing more in, in, in agriculture and, and, and improving food security. But, um, you know, overall, I think that uh, much, much more uh, needs to be done. Um, quite a few years back, actually, the 2007, 2008, 2009, when the food prices were high there, um, a program was established called the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, GAFSP, G-A-F-S-P, horrible acronym, um, but it came out of the G, the, the G uh, back then it was the, G, the G8, I think, anyway, D8, and, and then the G20 uh, endorsed it. And, you know, it, 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 it's a, the whole idea was to boost agricultural productivity in particularly in low and middle income countries. And um, what are we now about sort of 12, 13 years hence, um, just over a billion dollars, maybe $1.5 billion has been allocated to that. What a, what a, what, you know, sort of a pathetic amount of, of investment has, has gone into a program designed to boost agricultural productivity in developing countries. I was involved in that. And, uh, you know, um, obviously the international development banks, the, the World Bank, the, the, the regional development banks need to be investing more in this. Countries themselves, uh, many of them are prioritizing agriculture, um, but, but still we're a, a, a long way, um, you know, from, from, from what is needed. Um, agricultural research is, is, is underfunded. Um, something called the CGIAR, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. This is a global system of research networks. I mentioned, I mentioned IRI, you know, the Rice Research Institute. Um, the whole system is less than a billion dollars a year. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned in the book somewhere that, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi between them spend $8 billion a year on marketing. $8 billion a year on marketing. Um, and we can't seem to get together a billion dollars a year to support agricultural research across, um, you know, all the different crops and livestock that, uh, you know, provide food for most of the world's population. So um, I, I don't, I don't really know, um, you know, no, 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 the answer I've, I've suggested in the book, some sort of changes in the global architecture. I, I think, uh, you know, we have, you know, good organizations. We have the world food program. We have FAO, we have EFAT and others, but you know, they're, they're, they're way too small, um, in relation to the challenge. And, uh, it's just going to require leaders to, to, to really step up and, 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 and put money up because we need public investment. I mean, the private sector can do a lot. Uh, I think there's a huge role for the private sector in terms of innovation, in terms of distribution and so on. But um, they'll go where the public investments go as well. So whether it's infrastructure, whether it's um, public sector research, whether it's extension systems. In some cases, you're going to need some um, support in terms of credit for small scale farmers. Um, but, you know, bringing, bringing public and private together, I think it's going to be necessary. But, uh, you know, we need, you know, times 10 what it is today in order to really address uh, the challenges that I've been talking about. Thank you. So now we have a question about diets. Um, what are your thoughts on the implementation of plant-based diets, which are less resource intensive? Yeah, well, plant-based diets, certainly that is the, the recommendation, um, you know, in terms of healthy diets, on, if we look at it on a global scale, um, overall, we would like to see a shift towards uh, plant-based diets. When I say we, um, I'm, I'm reflecting a, uh, an important um, report that I refer to in the book a few times, and that's uh, in 2019, the EAT Lancet report, EAT Lancet report, uh, the, the idea of uh, a, 
a planetary health diet, uh, diets that are good for, 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 for us as humans, for our own health and for the planet's health. Um, a number of recommendations there were that um, overall we should increase the amount of protein derived from, from plants. Um, you know, we should all eat more fruits and vegetables. We should reduce um, calorie, uh, uh, you know, carbohydrate uh, intakes. Uh, and, and, and so on. There's a set of recommendations there. You know, the thing is, um, one can't have a blanket recommendation for the planet. One can say overall what needs to happen, but then we go, we need to sort of go down to the next level. We need to say, well, what about at the national level? What about at the local level? What needs to be done? So um, this, these things need to be very much um, downsized and, and adapted according to context. There's a, there's a new Eat Lancet um, Commission 2.0 working on these things at the moment. But uh, it, you know, the, the idea that if one takes from the report that livestock are bad, uh, that's a big thing. Um, of course, for folks in the West, for folks in the United States and Europe and Australia and, 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 and other places, we're eating way too much uh, in terms of animal products, both, both for our own good and for the planet's good. Um, but in other parts of the world, um, you know, there's, there's a billion people on the planet who depend on livestock systems as, as part of their, as their livelihoods. Uh, there's 250 million people depend on fisheries. Um, that you know, th there's a high dependency on on livestock systems and fishery systems in terms of income and in terms of diets. So uh, you know, we we just we just have to understand context when when we do this. But but overall, much can be done um, in you know the part of the world that we're speaking from today. Much can be done in and has to be done in terms of reducing um, our uh, consumption of livestock products and shifting more towards plant-based products. And this is just a, a personal follow-up question. Do you know the percentage of which the crops of which we actually grow are diverted to feed uh, animal livestock that then we ultimately are consuming? Do you have a sense of like that kind of breakdown? Not on a, not on a global scale, but I think, uh, for example, um, in the United States, the the, the corn and, and, and soybean crops are predominantly, are mainly um, not used for human, directly for human consumption. Gotcha, very interesting. Uh, we have another question about diets. Um, what can we learn, uh, what can we learn between developed world diets versus developing world diets and how can we rebalance them if needed? Yeah, I think I might have addressed that to, to some extent, and I don't want to go too far down that route because it's not not my personal um, area of strength. But I think it just reinforces the point. Although I, I must say, I would uh, you know, it's it's not simply a case of um, developing and developed. Uh, it, it is it is way 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 more uh, nuanced uh, than that. Um, there's a lot of variation within countries as well. Uh, in the so-called uh, developing world, low-income countries, um, diets in urban settings versus rural settings uh, are very different, and um, and different regions of different countries have different um, preferences, different livelihood systems, different you know, different uh, customs and and traditions. So, I, you know, I think the main point generally is to, you know, as I as I emphasised, you know, we have. We have a situation where a large number of people are not meeting their nutrient requirements. Now, uh, you know, if it's purely in terms of energy, it's 800 million people. But if we include micronutrients, it's way, it's more than 2 billion people. All right. So the, we need to fill the nutrient gap for, for those folks, right? We need to add, uh, whether it's, golden rice, vitamin A, uh, through vegetables or some other form, protein increases. But even for 800 million people, we need more energy. Um, we need more calories. So, you know, that's one part of it. And then you've got a, a lot of other folks who are over consuming, um, you know, various products, including, you know, starchy foods, including sugars, including, um, you know, animal products and the like. And, and, and we need to 
kind of ratchet them, bring them back. Uh, and so we need to move towards this, what I call a convergence on, on a healthy diet. And every setting is different. One needs to make that kind of an assessment and, and understand, so what's missing here? How do we fill those gaps? Um, is needed to bring down excessive consumptions, excessive consumption of, of unhealthy products, be it particular nutrients or or even um, you know processed foods and the like. How do we how do we actually change those patterns? And I think that's that's the important part. Not it, it's not actually a, you know rich country poor country type of situation at all. It's 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 much more nuanced than that. Thank you. All right, now we have a question about sort of on-farm implementation. So we have a question uh, about how do we get farmers to implement widespread drip agriculture to preserve water and low nitrogen fertilizer to reduce nitrous oxide emissions? Well, uh, again, this is <laughs> that my students get frustrated with me when I keep saying, well, it, it depends on the context. I, I use the term depends and context uh, a, a, a lot. But, you know, we've <coughs> there, there's a couple of things there. OK, so drip irrigation. We, the, the, the basic idea here is that um, we need to be much more efficient in our water use. I said already that 70% uh, of freshwater extractions goes into agriculture. In many cases, it's going into agriculture that, that is very wasteful and uses high quantities of water for the amount of uh, economic product that comes out uh, as a result of the agriculture. So I think every situation needs to be assessed on its own. Um, drip irrigation, of course, is a, a significant uh, capital investment. Um, we've seen you know, various parts of the world are extremely um, good at this uh, and, and it is, most certainly uh, been a way of managing very limited um, water uh, resources. But, you know, for, for vast areas of the world, um, it, we have to look at all kinds of other options. And for, frankly, for, um, you know, most of the world's agriculture is rain fed. So it doesn't have access to any form of irrigation, drip or otherwise. And, uh, that means we need to be, and I emphasize this in the water chapter, um, we need to spend a lot more time thinking about how to make better use of rain fed systems. Um, a lot of the investment uh, in agriculture has been allocated to irrigated systems. All right. Um, uh, uh, rain fed systems have been under invested over the years. The point about fertilizer, uh, likewise, um, you know, fertilizer is necessary, but um, look at the crisis we're facing today, um, you know, with with uh, high relatively, it's although they've come down a little bit, um, fertilizer prices are quite elevated, particularly um, since the, um, the Ukraine uh, uh, crisis, uh, availability of fertilizers uh, in, in, in many parts of the world is, is limited, prices are high. Uh, so if farmers are going to use them, they, they better use it very, very efficiently. So precision agriculture, precision application of nutrients, um, of, of fertilizers is, is absolutely essential. Uh, we can't afford to waste um, these nutrients um, for pure, um, if for no other reason, purely for economic reasons. But of course, there are uh, important environmental reasons to, you know, to be um, focusing on precision agriculture as well. All righty. We have another question about, uh, can we achieve food security in places without stable democratic government or that are experiencing ongoing conflict? Uh, it's really difficult, right? Uh, the point is, um, if, if you look at countries that have let's say the, the worst uh, indications of food security at the moment, um, they're almost all uh, in a state of, of conflict or, or, or recent conflict uh, or a combination of that and climate, uh, 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 you know, climate change and, and, and drought and the like. But uh, so uh, what do we do? We can't just walk away uh, and, and 
I think you know we we need to absolutely um, put effort into the first thing one should do is try to solve the conflict, right? Um, but you know that's not my job or yours. Uh, this is not what we do. There are people who do that, uh, and 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 we want them to do it. But we should be also um, creatively looking at how do you how do we do a better job of improving the level of food security in uh, conflict and post-conflict settings. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a hell of a big ask if, if bullets are flying around, to be quite honest. But if there is a way in which um, particularly, you know, once we have a relatively peaceful situation, obviously the first step is to keep people alive, right? That's the first thing we want to do, which means we've got to bring food in to keep people alive. But what we've not done a very good job at in the past is building the resilience um, that leads to a longer sort of a, a longer term uh, level of uh, improvement in the state of food security in a country. So what does that mean? Uh, it means it means infrastructure, it means uh, building capacity, it means uh, strengthening institutions. And you know if, if anybody's interested in an example of how that was done, um, I, I do have a whole uh, section of one of the chapters, I think it was chapter two, um, talking about Cambodia. Um, I, you know, I worked in Cambodia immediately soon after the Khmer Rouge period uh, and worked on the reconstruction uh, in, in a, very much a, a, a classical post-conflict setting. And um, what I do hope that through that case, uh, one could be encouraged to believe that at least when we have some semblance of peace and security, then come in there with agricultural improvements, with technology, with infrastructure, with institutions, with building capacity, building local capacity. Uh, I, I, I think all of that is possible. But as I said, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an almost uh, impossible task to, to do that when, um, when you simply, you know, when people can't even, don't even have the ability to harvest a crop that they planted, which is, you know, that's the case when when you have a war going on. So first of all, stop the war, uh, and then let's go in and and you know work with local communities and local populations and s see what we can do. And I think many a number of countries have done a, a, a pretty impressive job in that respect after conflict. And I gave the example of Cambodia, but you can look at Rwanda uh, as another very, very positive example of a country that was able to rebuild um, after, a, you know, a, an awful uh, period of conflict. We have a question from Gabrielle about food waste. So she says that she's very passionate about food waste. And as an individual, how can I help to support this portion in particular, besides just being aware of my own food waste? Are there organizations you could suggest that I could volunteer at or help to support? Thank you. Well, um, I don't know where Gabriel is from. Um, and again, I, you know, I think what we're finding now is um, actually food waste is something that is, act, that is really starting to resonate with people. Uh, I, I, I've taught a course at, at CEPA at Columbia for 14 years. This is a 14th year, a food systems course. And about halfway through, around seven years ago, I introduced a separate chapter, I said, not a chapter, a chapter, a separate session uh, on, on, on post-harvest losses and post-harvest uh, waste. And I was a bit nervous about whether, you know, whether the, the class would be interested, but it's subsequently turned out to be um, one of the areas that is most, you know, the, the, the most engagement occurs because everybody has a story, right? They have their own stories. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, just just about yourselves, but, you know, about your community, about your family. Uh, and, and, and most people uh, are rightly uh, outraged 
at the level of uh, food waste um, that, that that exists. But you know, every you know, presuming from the United States, but uh, pretty much every city, uh, every major city in the United States has various kinds, various NGOs and non nonprofit organizations that are involved in uh, food rescues of various kind, like making sure that food that potentially could be reused, um, not reused, but could be used rather than discarded, um, you know, that that goes um, in, you know, into people's mouths rather than, um, in, you know, in, into the landfills. Um, one of the shocking statistics that, that I came across was that about a quarter uh, of the quantity of uh, waste that goes into landfills is food. Um, it's, it's actually the highest uh, uh, component, the largest component of all the different categories of, of, of waste that ends up in, in landfills. That should be absolutely our, our last resort. There are many ways in which food can be you know, used. And I think um, one of the interesting things coming up is uh, you know, not necessarily volunteering, but, but you know, there's uh, new types of uh, you know, social entrepreneurs and, 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 and even for-profit enterprises that are starting to look at how uh, food waste can be avoided, how food could be uh, you know, more effectively transformed into something else. I've heard of even here in, in, uh, in, in New York, uh, beer being, sorry, bread being turned into beer uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, that, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, um, uh, you know, possibilities there. Um, use of um, artificial intelligence to improve the ability of uh, retailers to price their product so that it really is purchased and consumed before the use by date. Uh, and, you know, there, there, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, legal and, and other, you know, sort of regulatory uh, aspects around this, but um, th th there are very interesting possibilities with uh, digital technologies and, and being able to, um, in terms of pricing and understanding availability of food and accessing consumers uh, and, and, you know, as a result, having a more sustainable, um, you know, distribution and consumption system. And if, if you are in DC where you asked that question, you can take your compost to the local farmer's market on the weekends, just putting that out there as well. Yeah, but, you know, again, compost is, is still a bit, it's down in terms of the priorities. That's def but definitely better than landfill. Um, feeding livestock is, is, is a little bit higher than that. Mm. Uh, but feeding people is great. Uh, and best of all is you don't waste it yourself. You, you purchase the right amounts, you manage your refrigerator effectively, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you reuse uh, food, you know, uh, and there's lots of ways in which uh, it can be done. Um, the US is very good at this. The UK is, I would say, even more um, along uh, in that respect. And you could take a look at, uh, again, in the book, I've referred to a few of the organizations that are there. Um, you know, really doing a, a, a fine job uh, in partnership with with uh, supermarkets and, and other retailers. All right. We have a question on climate change. How will climate change affect the sustainability strategies for different parts of the world? Um, and maybe if you want to provide an example for in the US, where I know there's kind of increasingly common extreme weather events, um, kind of how, how farmers, maybe the smaller farmers can adapt to you know, extreme weather events going forward or increase access to some of these. I know in the book, you discuss climate services, sort of increasing climate literacy for the small farmers mm. along the, along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think we, we covered a little bit earlier, but, you know, the idea is that, um, you know, climate change will affect our, let's just say our production systems, it, it affects the whole system, right? It affects our transportation systems and distribution systems as well. But just, just focusing on the production side of things, again, it's very, uh, it's very context specific. So what, what, you know, if you're in a, you know, if you're in a, in a place that, uh, 
uh, you know, is potentially flood prone, uh, you know, the frequency of floods may very well uh, begin to increase. And uh, similarly, if you're in one of those areas that is uh, relatively drought prone and you're a rain fed uh, farmer of some sort, um, you, you, you know, you're going to have more, more cases of crop yield loss and more cases of complete loss. Um, so it, you know, it, it's going to affect, uh, it's going to affect everyone. Um, and, and there are, you know, various ways in which you can, um, improve, uh, your resilience, uh, to all this. And, um, you know, I referred to, uh, the, the, the three components. One is resist, uh, uh, one is recover, two is recover, and three is reorient. So resisting, um, examples of resisting would be that, you know, if, if, if you have a, in terms of a crop, if you have a crop variety that has tolerance of drought uh, or, or greater heat tolerance, um, or uh, a wonderful example uh, of uh, submergence tolerance is a, an example I gave, uh, it's called sub one rice or scuba rice, which is a, a type of rice that can withstand absolute submergence for about two to three weeks. And, you know, these are ways in which one can resist these, you know, uh, calamities that are, that are taking place. Recovering, um, that's when, as you mentioned, crop insurance, you know, um, basically having uh, uh, systems of food security, food storage and the like, being able to recover from a disaster, um, having networks, um, um, you know, to, to be able to, to sort of fill gaps when, when, when they happen. Um, and, and finally, reorient, you know, it may be you've got to change your system altogether. You may, you know, you're just growing the wrong stuff. If you're growing, uh, uh, you know, in in California, some of the crops that are very high in terms of their their uh, consumption of water, may, may, maybe the time has come to switch to different kinds of commodities, different types of crops, uh, or, or or you know, or production enterprise systems. Um, you know, again, an example from the developing world in the Mekong Delta with salinity. You know, with with the rising sea level and um, increased salinity in the Mekong Delta, there's actually a shift from rice to aquaculture, to shrimps, and uh, first of all, as a rotation, and in the worst uh, case scenarios, they're switching completely to shrimp, and it's actually proving way more profitable than the original rice. So, climate change, you know, can also potentially lead to opportunities. Um, but, you know, that, that's the way I look, you know, resist, recover and, and, and reorient um, and, and look at it in whatever context you happen to be working in. Mm -hmm. I like that. The, the three R's are a good, a good takeaway. Um, and I know we're about just about done with time. It looks like we have two minutes left, but I will ask you one last question that you can maybe translate into your kind of closing. Um, but ultimately, it's a it's a really fascinating book. I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, there's a ton of information in there that you know obviously we cannot cover in an hour and a half. Um, but ultimately, I would like to know what is one thing you would want people to take away from your book, and then with that, I will let you also close out on uh, those thoughts <laughs> too. One one thing one thing uh, I'd like you to take away from it. Um, I, I won't stick to one. I, I think that if there's one word that I've repeated more than any other, it's context. Okay. Um, so, so that is so important that, that there's no single solution, silver bullet, quick fix. We need to understand context in order to come up with a set of solutions. And I talk about my big five, right? But the big five is, is, is just a starting point. You can, you can look at sustainable, sustainable intensification probably isn't appropriate for New York City, but social protection, post harvest, market connections and the like market infrastructure, they're very, and healthy diets, very important, right? So, so understanding context and designing systems around context, um, that, that, that's, that's probably the, 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 the main takeaway. Um, 
And I, if I would give one more, it would be to say, it's not just what to do, it's how to do it. So it's the know-how and the do-how. I got that from my mentor, Dr. MS Swaminathan, uh, and, and he used that in the past and I, it, it, it stuck with me and it's so, it's so appropriate in, in, in this situation. So let me just sort of finish. I, I wanted to say, you know, in, 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 in closing, um, you know, that, so why, why, why would I have the courage, I would say, the, or the audacity, perhaps more realistically to, to write this kind of book and to actually say, I think, I think we can transform the food system. I believe we can achieve universal food security. I, there, there are three reasons. One is basically I've been incredibly fortunate in, in my career uh, to, to know so many smart, practical people uh, and to have access to an extraordinary amount of literature uh, and to be able to piece together um, you know, what I hope is a reasonable synthesis of, 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 of what is possible. Um, you know, that, that gives me some confidence, um, trying to bring it together, uh, and, and, and operating on evidence, uh, I think is really important in, in, at a time when often we do have these, um, uh, sort of false dichotomies and, 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 sort of ideologically driven arguments around what is appropriate and what is not. Secondly, you know, I, although I'm at Columbia now, uh, and I have been for the past 14 years, for 40 years, I've been a practitioner. I mean, my job has been essentially from day one, my first job is to get things done, is to sort of put good ideas into practice. And so that's been the focus and that's the focus of the book as well. I really want to think, now, what does this actually mean to a farmer? What does this mean to a consumer? What does this mean um, to a lending institution and so on? So being a practitioner and, and, and I've had enough successes and, and, I've, and I'm bearing a few scars uh, to, to, to be confident that, that what's there is, is feasible and I'm not, not really giving fa false hope. And the final thing I wanted to say is, especially for the last 14 years, I've been a professor of practice at SEPA at Columbia. And, and there, I think the, um, it, it's really been, you know, an extraordinary privilege really to be able to, to teach, to mentor, but also to learn from young people, um, young professionals, uh, people doing the master's program that I uh, direct the MPA in development practice. And that has given me really a lot of confidence and a lot of inspiration to really believe that if they move into these kinds of leadership roles, whether it's in government, in the UN and private sector, or they create their own social enterprises, I think we're, 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 we really have a great opportunity. And that's why it's, it's wonderful that, you know, Columbia and Harvard, University of Queensland sort of co-sponsoring this. Um, it's it, because I, I think um, you know, universities and other institutions of higher education, I think are going to be really key in creating this new cadre of, of uh, practitioner leaders um, that, that are going to you know, bring about the, the changes that we need you know, for a different kind of a food system. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you both so much for tonight and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, that is our time. We went just a little bit over, but thank you all for sticking with us. A couple of reminders, we do have a link to the book in the email as well as I believe on the website as well as a discount code um, to get I think 20% off. And we did record the event and the recording will go out tomorrow. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.